Hi everybody, it's Friday, January 31st, and this is Retail Now, RNG's weekly podcast, bringing you news and insight from what's happening now in retail. This is our first episode, so thank you for joining us. And I'm joined today by two of our analysts, Mary Sullivan. Hello. And Hannah Donahue. Hola. <laughs> Hannah is our Latin American expert, and I'm Keith Anderson from the advisory practice. Uh, we'll start each episode with a little bit about what we've been up to, and it's been a busy few weeks for all of us. Mary, what have you been up to? Uh, about two weeks ago, both Keith and I were in Canada. Uh, we were talking about e-commerce. I was presenting at the FCBC, which is Food and Consumer Products Conference, about sort of the Canadian landscape in terms of e-commerce and how that's going to develop and how brands can really engage and help move the needle with e-commerce. Huge growth in Canada in e-commerce uh, fr- from an income and education and technology adoption point of view. It's a market that's even more mature than the U.S., but e-commerce has lagged. So we're pretty heartened to see that the food and consumer goods industry there is really getting amped up about the potential for e-commerce and happy to be a part of the conference there with FCPC. We also spent some time with COPA, which is the Canadian Office Products Association, doing a bit of a deep dive on Amazon. Uh, And Hannah, what have you been up to? I spent a week in Mexico, uh, in Guadalajara, in Mexico City, uh, really seeing some of the stores, looking around. We visited uh, Petco's first store that they opened in Guadalajara. They'll be opening a second one this year in Mexico City. So we saw that store really interesting from a premiumization standpoint, natural foods, um, and just the overall in-store experience and service. We also saw uh, both at the both ends of the spectrum, the low cost and really premium operators uh, from a food standpoint, a lot on grocerants and, and following the food migration. So good times there. Nicer weather. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, there's a lot to cover this week, starting with a few major earnings announcements from some major retailers. And we'll start with Amazon. Amazon had a pretty good fourth quarter and a reasonably good full year, but their top line came in a little below analyst consensus expectations, so the stock was hammered a little bit. Uh, But by far, the biggest surprise was the disclosure that Amazon is considering an increase in the annual membership fee for Amazon Prime. In the nine years since Prime has, has been a program at Amazon, there haven't been any price increases. Something Bezos has often cited as a sign of Amazon's commitment to low prices. But citing rising fuel costs and and shipping costs, plus just heavier usage of Prime, Amazon is thinking now of raising the the membership fee anywhere from $20 to $40. And on the surface, I think Amazon has a little bit of license to increase the fee. And obviously, it's one of many steps they've taken recently really over the last 18 or 24 months to improve profitability. They've recently changed their uh, commission structure for low dollar items on the third party platform. They've made changes to the way vendors engage them around pack configuration and packaging. There's, there's at least a dozen examples, but I think it's, it's starting to become very clear that Amazon is getting serious and 2014 may be something of a transitional year for them. Uh, it was interesting, our forecast for Amazon for 2013 was within 0.6% of the actual number, which we're happy about, and our forecast for Amazon for 2014 has them growing at the top end of their guidance of 13 to 24%. We've got them at 22.4% for 2014 and a, a compound annual growth rate of 18.8% out to 2018. So we always revise our forecast based on these sorts of releases. And if you want to hear more about Amazon, you can join Mary and me for the Amazon and Focus podcast that we publish separately. Uh, One other major retailer that had a big earnings announcement Mm -hmm. was Walmart. And Hannah, you spent some time digging into their earnings? I did. Um, So Walmart's revised sort of their consensus forecast, uh, both from an earnings standpoint and from a comp standpoint. Um, From earnings, they revised those down a little bit. Uh, The results will actually be out February 20th, but so far what they've said is that due to factors like 
50 or so store closures between Brazil and China, uh, cuts to food stamps, and a few other me measures, the restructuring of Sam's Club and cutting some of the workforce there. Um, earnings will be down uh, below consensus a little bit uh, or forecast. Uh, and then from a comp standpoint, uh, for the Walmart discount stores, previously in Q3 they were saying it would be about flat for Walmart and flat to 2% growth for Sam's Club, uh, which they've now said will be below expectations. Uh, bigger impact from cutting of food stamps and uh, impacts from the weather is what they've cited so far. I think we know the discount stores are really under a lot of pressure and it feels like there's a, a potentially larger than expected percentage of the Supercenter store base that's under pressure. Mm -hmm. A lot of energy is going into these emerging small formats, the Express, the neighborhood market stores. What, what is our outlook for some of those formats, Anna? We're pretty positive on them from an Express standpoint. I think the Walmart Express store is really interesting because the pilot so far has been in rural areas, uh, within North Carolina specifically, where you know, there are bigger food deserts, uh, more competition from the discounters, and I think they've really started to figure out some of the competitive dynamics and uh, tethering model between those stores. Uh, Target Express, which I think will be, you know, the one that will open in July will be an urban store, uh, but I think that will be a, a good test for them to really get to understand the urban dynamics because the city's Target stores are smaller, but they're not small stores, um, so I think going... 90,000 square feet or Yeah, they're 90,000 right? square feet. Okay. They're not, I mean, they're not small stores. This store will be 20,000 square feet in the bottom of an apartment complex, um, pretty close to a university as well, so they'll have natural traffic. Um, it'll have pharmacy as a trip driver in addition to food and GM. Uh, they're still hoping to keep a little bit of the treasure hunt experience in there. Uh, they're adding more food to go, expanded assortment for that, and also they've they've said they haven't specified exactly what, but they will tailor the checkout to higher traffic and smaller baskets. And some of you may have joined Hannah a few hours ago for her webinar previewing the small store summit we're hosting this April. For those that didn't make it, any highlights that you would share, Hannah? Yeah, I think a few things. Um, we have updated our forecast in total for small boxes in the U.S. So from 2014 to 2017, 50% of sales growth and 95% of store growth or net new store growth will come from stores that are on average uh, 35,000 square feet or smaller. Wow. So that's that's pretty significant. Uh, we talked a lot about the complexity and the fragmentation within small boxes. Uh, the segmentation that brands are going to need to align with. So a lot of changes coming up, a lot of complexity, and a lot to think about. Uh, well, if, if you're not already planning to, we're hosting that event in Dallas April 8th and 9th. We've got separate routes for the store tours on the 8th for food and non-food. And then again on, on April 9th for the uh, afternoon sessions, we've got breakouts so if you're a retailer or a manufacturer focused in the food side of the industry or non-food, we've got targeted content for you. We've got some pretty interesting speakers lined up too. We do. Uh, Derek Gaskins from Rudders will be joining us. He has a really interesting perspective, both working for sort of one of the regional but very strong convenience superstores, really innovative from a merchandising, uh, digital standpoint, food service as well. Um, and he has experience at Nax and Giant Eagle as well. Um, we have Aram Rubinson joining us, um, so industry analyst, uh, financial analyst, and we're really excited about it. So you can check the show notes for the link to the full agenda and how to register. Uh, February 7th is the deadline for early bird registration. Mm -hmm. So join us if you can, uh, and the sooner the better because there's pretty significant savings. Well, it, it's not all challenging news for mm -hmm. Walmart. There was an interesting development in their online business this week. Uh, Mary, Walmart to go is expanding its pilot in Denver. Yep. Walmart to go is kind of an interesting pilot by Walmart. It's moved out of beta, but it has pretty much three different legs. So it launched the third leg of that in Denver uh, just a few days ago. It's a click and collect type model, except for it's a for a full basket of goods, which has both temperature control, fresh, frozen. So basically, it's a grocery full basket grocery model that consumers can go pick up from the store. And it also includes a wide selection of general merchandise as well. So they can 
get their full basket of groceries as long as, as well as some other electronics, toys, and a few other uh, general merchandise options. So that launched uh, just recently, but Walmart has had kind of a legacy with Walmart to go in Denver. They originally launched with same day delivery under Walmart to go that was just general merchandise. It had no option for fresh perishable frozen goods and it wasn't even delivered through their own trucks. They were using CV or UPS and it was a same day delivery option, order in the morning and it will be delivered to you in a window from I think 4 to 10 p.m. But in I think October 2013, they allowed for full basket delivery in that market. It's the first market outside of their uh, e-commerce sort of headquarters in Silicon Valley. So they offer this full basket model since 2011 in San Francisco and San Jose, where they're operating their own temperature controlled trucks and delivering the full basket of goods to consumers at their homes during certain uh, time slots as well. But the really interesting part about the Walmart to go pickup location that they launched in Denver is that the service is completely free. So when you think about walmart.com, which is just the national ship model, and how 50% of those orders are picked up in Walmart stores, Walmart's consumers are very price conscious. So this ability to get the convenience of getting your whole shopping trip online, uh, but not having to walk the store, and then not having to pay that fee to get it delivered to your house, um, we can see taking some traction in the full basket models as well. And, and there's often a huge motivation for brick and mortar players to offer this pickup option because it minimizes the incremental capital they have to spend on dedicated fulfillment or distribution centers. Mm -hmm. It may drive somebody inside the store where they might buy more. And Walmart has an executive that they exported from the UK or imported, I suppose, to Silicon Valley to lead up this full basket grocery pilot who's got a huge amount of experience with models like this, Asda is the number two online grocer in the UK. And so the, the real question, I think, is not whether Walmart's got the operational expertise, it's really what does demand look like. And they're, they're certainly not the only brick and mortar player that's escalating their investment in click and collect models in the US. Peapot mm -hmm. has been, adding a, a pretty significant number of new pickup points, some of which are co-located with Peapod stores and some of which are standalone. Uh, and they're fulfilling those online orders from both stores and fulfillment centers, depending on the geography. But it's gonna be a pretty interesting year, I, I think. Uh, you know, the, the ramp for online grocery typically takes a lot longer than people realize, especially in these local models. But the, the availability of the option to order online, whether for delivery or pickup, is exploding. We'll talk more about Amazon Fresh on the Amazon and Focus podcast. But Instacart this week just disclosed they've been growing 10% week over week. And it's a, a small base. But they shared a statistic that I, I candidly am a little dubious about. And uh, Instacart, I'm happy to discuss this with you if you'd like to reach out. But they claim that about 90% of Instacart shoppers are actually abandoning stores. And so we know that a lot of online grocery shoppers tend to be the elderly, sometimes the infirm, maybe just shut-ins who don't want to leave the house. But it's a pretty terrifying statistic if this 90-day delivery, or excuse me, 90-minute delivery window that Instacart tries to offer really does change behavior that dramatically. Mm -hmm. uh, like I say, I'm skeptical, but uh, it's a pretty bold claim. Yeah, but when you think about where Instacart's delivery sort of area is, it's within those very urban, very dense centers. So they're targeting people who are walking distance to a lot of different convenience options, some of the small boxes mm -hmm. that have those fresh fill-in trips. So they're targeting those that might then substitute the full grocery stock up trip with Instacart and then use the convenience options that are around them to fill in with the one or two items they might not be getting out of their weekly order. I, I think it's going to be so interesting with Instacart in particular who unlike some of the other expedited delivery players is not necessarily partnered with the retailers whose stores they're picking from. The way that Deliv and eBay Now and Google Shopping Express and others are uh, their long-term revenue model, I think, is either going to have to 
involve some level of cooperation from the retailers whose stores they're picking from, or they may simply be trying to aggregate the demand across all of the retailers they're picking from, Shaw's, Safeway, Trader Joe's, uh, no longer, Costco, others. And, uh, you know, they, they may be trying to build a media business because with the aggregate demand, they could tell brands all kinds of targeted promotional opportunities that are retailer agnostic. So they're VC back, they don't have a clear revenue model, but they're definitely one that we're paying close attention to. And I can't wait until they deliver to RNG headquarters out here in Waltham. Uh, Hannah, you mentioned some of the layoffs and store closures at the Sam's Club division and Target mm -hmm. following a difficult fourth quarter, really uh, sort of exacerbated by the security breach that's right. been very well publicized. Uh, you know, Target only laid off just shy of 500 people, which as a percentage of their total headcount is, is not a major number. And I think the Sam's Club layoffs were around 2% Yeah, it was around, right around 2%, about 2,300 people. So it, it's, it's reasonably clear that most retailers depend pretty heavily on the fourth quarter for a lot of seasonal volume, and some retailers only break even in the fourth quarter. I think what we're seeing is a first line of response, which is cut labor, cut headcount, mm -hmm to try and bring the profit picture in line. But the big question I think a lot of folks are asking is, what kind of excess store capacity may we be looking at? And we at RNG have been saying for the last three or four years that it's not a question of if, but when. We're gonna have to acknowledge that in the US and some other developed markets, mm -hmm. certain formats and certain channels are really significantly overstored. Uh, so, as part of our forecasting process, as more retailers announce earnings, we're definitely going to be refining our perspective on what this year looks like. Yeah. But I, I would anticipate that not too long after you hear more of the headcount reductions, you may start to see some real uh, store and square footage reductions. Uh, well, what's everybody have going on for the next week, Mary? Uh, Keith and I are headed to Chicago, where we have uh, one of our digital group meetings. So it's an aggregate of a lot mm -hmm. of major brands, e-commerce directors, and a few other high-level people within their team to really discuss what's going on in the e-commerce landscape in the, UN in the U.S. and how they're working through some of those issues. Yeah, huge update on topics like digital asset management and managing e-commerce in a fact-based way. We're going to hear from two of the big U.S. online grocers mm -hmm. who are willing to share their perspective with us. And Hannah, what's on the docket for you? I will be doing some more further small store research, uh, working on the summit that's coming up, and then uh, working on a little bit of research from North America and Latin America, uh, particularly around consumer electronics. And, and that category in general. Well, we want to thank everybody for joining us. Please see the show notes for links to articles that expand on some of the topics that we discussed. Please don't hesitate to reach us over email or on Twitter with questions, tips, uh, and maybe most importantly, go Broncos. It's Super Bowl weekend. I'm sure you're all going to be watching the game Sunday, so are we, and uh, let's hope we get the, the right outcome. Have a good weekend. We'll see everybody next week.